It was in this very room that uh, David Cameron and uh, George Osborne uh, propounded their vision for the Northern Powerhouse just over two years ago. Uh, of course, they're both now gone, but we're all still left here uh, to pick up the pieces. And that's what we have to do tonight. We're in a situation that none of us on the panel or in the audience could possibly have anticipated. And what we're really interested in is how we, as designers and creative industries, what we can do, really, to help fix it. So I'm hoping that somebody is going to come up with some answers. And so I'm going to hand you over to the chair of our advisory panel, Design Manchester, who has really done a great deal to help make this thing happen, who is also chairing tonight, and that is Lou Cordwell. Thank, thanks, Casper. And I would have worn nicer shoes had I known I wasn't going to be sat behind there. So, so I'm desperately uncomfortable, but don't look down, just look at my face. Uh, so uh, welcome to Design Manchester 2016. Uh, and to yeah, the magnificent uh, bonded warehouse. It's uh, yeah, uh, uh, gorgeous to be here. And uh, as is traditional uh, for the great debate, uh, even though we're up against a Bake Off semi-finals tonight, it is a sold-out event, which is uh, which is great and testament to the fantastic panelists we've got with us um, this evening. So uh, this year we're going to talk about city identity, as you'll have gathered uh, from, from uh, the, the theme of, of the festival so far, and in particular the nature and character of the cities of the future. So um, as we always do, we're working to a kind of question time-esque format with some questions in the audience already prepared, but we're hoping and that you're going to be a vocal and active bunch, and if you've got questions or comments or anything as we uh, move through the, the evening, then stick your hand up. We've got some mics and we'll come and find you, and um, we're, we're hoping for, for lots of debate. So. Um, so and we've got one hour before we go and do some drinks over there and carry on with the, the conversation, as Casper says. So um, I think it's time to introduce our panel. And um, yeah, the Design Manchester website promised you a glamorous panel at the nexus of design, innovation and policy. So lots to live up to. I'm sure we won't be disappointed. Uh, so, um, OK, in, in no particular order, um, let's start with Claire Mukherjee, who is an urbanist and designer. Um, we have Lord Mandelson, who, as we know, was UK Cabinet Minister and EU Trade Commissioner and now is MNU Chancellor. From um, the co-op, we have um, Ema Coleman, uh, who uh, was previously um, at GDS and uh, founder of the London Data Store and now is an honorary Mancunian. I think you're now in that. As, as of this week's blog, you, you've made that status, Ema. Um, we've got Ian Anderson, who, of course, is the founder of Designs Republic. And um, we have Andy Burnham, who is, as we know, MP for Lee and, of course, candidate for the Mayor of Greater Manchester. And last, by no means least, Mike Rawlinson, who uh, is founder and CEO of City ID and also the pioneer of the Legible Cities methodology. So, enough introductions. Let's go to our first question, which comes from Penny Macbeth who's right in front of me, and I'll save you the introduction, Penny. So, Penny is the Interim Dean of Manchester School of Art and Pro Vice-Chancellor at MMU. Yeah, you do. Yeah, it's on its way. Skills development is one of the areas devolved to Manchester under the devolution agreement with the government. How can the stakeholders in Manchester best work together to create opportunities for our young people and deliver the education and skills needed by industry, the city, and the country, and how can Manchester and Britain continue to um, be relevant and distinctive in, in its contribution? Brilliant. Thanks, Penny. Um, can, Andy, can we, can we yeah. start with you? You've got the difficult task of being the first panellist. <laughs> Not a problem at all. It's the right question to ask. Uh, I think it's the right place to start skills, because... If you look at the um, report that was commissioned by um, Transport for the North, the Independent Economic Review of the Northern Economy, and Greater Manchester included, the skills gap is the big issue that comes out of that report. It explains why we've got a productivity gap with the rest of the country. Transport, not far behind, but if you really want to kind of say, well, what's our problem here? It is skills, and, and we, I think we are victims, my view, of failed policy at a Westminster level over, over many years. Um, when we needed to be doing more to give young people skills, particularly skills that were linked to the world of work, the obsession nationally was all about the university route, which 
yeah, I have no problem, it's good for some, but it, it's not a solution for everybody, although national policy in education, in my view, has been overly focused, overly obsessive with the uh, university route, and consequently, um, lots of young people in Greater Manchester don't know, don't have hope for what's there for them at the end uh, of school, and I think we need to do something really ambitious uh, on skills, and I would plan to do that if I'm elected mayor uh, next um, uh, next year. The, the one first thing I would say is, you know, given these huge questions we face post um, referendum, and when we look to how we kind of uh, make Greater Manchester competitive, and how we make sure that all young people have a stake in the future, the one thing you don't do, in my view, is reintroduce selective education and grammar schools. That's the last uh, thing that you should do. What you should do instead is build an education system that offers true parity between the academic and the technical roots, in my view, I would say akin to the German uh, model. And that's what I would want to, to do. And you've kind of asked in your question, well, how, you know, is where you're getting to, how do you do that? Let me just throw a specific out. I don't want to kind of throw too many at you tonight, but let me give you one. One thing I will do if I'm elected, working with the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, is build a UCAS style system for apprenticeships across Greater Manchester. You know, a single system, a clearing system, that covers all of the apprent apprenticeships available. And I think the important thing of that is it means a young person in Oldham or Rochdale or Lee in my constituency, at the moment struggling to see what's out there for them, could go on to that and think, oh, hang on a minute, there is an apprenticeship over, over here that I could do. They lack that clarity at the moment. University students get very clear guidelines as to where they could go. I think we need to do the same for young people who want something different. But the thing about that, of course, is it would start to knit together the businesses and the universities and the colleges, and everyone would start to kind of focus on the, the apprenticeship offer and where we're strong and where we need to be strong in the future. The, the review mentions digital as a key area of strength. Well, we would need to start to put quality apprenticeships in that, in that area. And we've got to get our young people around. So I'm looking at, can we offer 16 to 18 year olds a, a free or a concessionary bus pass to get them to these opportunities? What I'm saying is we've got to have a massive change of the, of the game. The very last point, it gets you to, what's the point of devolution? What's the point of it? Is it that we're just going to do things slightly differently or slightly better than the government down in Westminster? I don't think that is the point of it. The point of devolution, it seems to me, is to say, do you know what? We're going to do things very differently. That's very much in the, the kind of Manchester spirit. We're going to do it differently. And the thing we're going to do differently is look after and invest in our young people differently. They've been the target for deficit reduction. They've borne the brunt of the cuts. You know, there were cuts that were made a few years ago that really were devastating for skills and aspiration in this city and in the city region. And I'm going to say, when I launch my campaign next month, young people are going to be at the heart of my campaign. Uh, their opportunities are everything to me. And we're going to kind of put the investment there with them so that we build a kind of hopeful, prosperous city region for the future. OK, Andy, thank you. Ema, could, could we go to you for yeah. some thought? Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about things like apprenticeships, I think we need to be absolutely crystal clear about where we're putting our focus. So if you look at the world of work generally, uh, we're looking at a, a vastly different world that's coming because of robotics and automation. So we used to think about robots, for example, they were going to take all the crap jobs. Well, it turns out they're coming to take all our jobs. So if we look at law as a profession and we look at e-discovery software, the ratio difference is going to be one to 500 lawyers. So I often hear people talking about apprenticeships and I'm thinking, well, you know, that's not really the right focus. It's where are these new uh, jobs going to come from? And we know largely they're going to come from technology and digital. We have developing inequalities in the tech world, we know, where very few women are entering uh, professions in STEM. And so when you ask the question of what should the stakeholders do, we have lots of access to coding courses, for example, but they're expensive. And I think the city should really decide we are going to be the ones that can do something in an area of inequality by focusing on getting a pipeline of potential uh, software developers uh, into the system and funding them through what courses are available. Because the reality is people who are living under a poverty line, people who are disadvantaged, are not going to be able to pay £7,000 or £4,000 for an online coding course. But we have to be really clear uh, when, when people talk about an industrial strategy, and that's talking to the past. We need to talk to the future. And that is going to be uh, how do we build a robust engineering base in this city. If you look at you know, regeneration that's happened globally. You look at Dublin, I'm, I'm Irish, so, so Dublin's my hometown. We see massive development in the Docklands since 2004. Google move in, and then all of these technology companies, um, you know, land there. But the truth is they're sales jobs. 
And so to give you an example, in, two, in 2015, AOL closed their entire sales team, right? So we've got to be very clear about where we have a laser-like focus on technology, where the stakeholders in the city, including the universities and the local authorities, take this inequality seriously and start putting some serious funding to developing those apprenticeships for the future, not for the past. Great. Peter, could we go to you? Um, well, l let, me, uh, let me get my endorsement in first, uh, because um, I was rather cheered up by what Andy was saying. Uh, for this reason, that in so many areas of uh, policy and public service, national systems of delivery have not worked adequately. They have left too many people out and left behind, and we have to trailblaze, we have to pioneer, we have to innovate in so many ways in how we design uh, public uh, policy and public service uh, provision and delivery. And, uh, and if you keep on like that, uh, with these sorts of, this sort of innovation and this sort of pioneering, you might even get elected. <laughs> um, uh, 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 and I think it's very important, obviously, that you do. Let me, let me just, um, just say this. I mean, a, a city's identity does not come from its marketing or its branding. It, it's defined by... Uh, its people, and the job of a city, and uh, what a uh, what makes a city great, uh, is its ability to enable all its people to become what they want to be. Now, what they want to be, how they live, how they enjoy life, um, how they work uh, in a city, is going to be progressively transformed chiefly by digitalization. That's the main technology driver. And if I had to boil down to two things which um, you know, really make the most difference to urban life and to uh, a successful uh, city delivering for all its people, it is technology and design. By design, I mean design in all its uh, forms. Uh, and uh, digitalization, just to state the obvious, you know, is going to do for us in our time and era what electricity did uh, for everyone and every place in a previous uh, era. The question, uh, though, that this begs is whether we are going to have digital inclusion uh, uh, or, or not whether this um, digital revolution uh, uh, is going to unfold in a way that's going to enable everyone to enjoy its benefits uh, and its opportunities, but also whether we're going to be able to harness this digital revolution, uh, not to centralise power, but to disperse it. Uh, and it gives us huge opportunities uh, to do so. But here's the point. If we're going to see digital inclusion, then we need first-rate and different forms of digital uh, education. And it's uh, imparting uh, skills to people so that they can live their lives and work in completely different ways, given the opportunities that are going to be created, that the education system now, across the country, but certainly in this region, has to sort of be rethought. It has to be re-geared. Uh, and that's why when I became uh, a Chancellor of Manchester Met, indeed before I did, the thing that I spotted um, amongst the things that the university was uh, trying to sort of design was this screen school. Now, a screen school sounds sort of rather sort of mundane and slightly peculiar, certainly off left field, but actually when you think of a screen, it's just about everything on which, through which, by means of which, we are going to be organising uh, our lives. And therefore, a screen school in Manchester, based at the university, if we can get you know, funding for it, uh, and we've already started to do so, will transform skill, delivery, education amongst technicians, programmers, designers, uh, the, 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 this digital revolution. Uh, uh, will create demand for. So that's, in my view, uh, uh, the sort of way, the way in which we've got to be thinking really big 
uh, and, and really differently uh, for, uh, for this century. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Ian, could we come to you for, for some designer thoughts and possibly a Sheffield perspective? Um, I don't... I mean, there's, there's three, three people who have given lots of facts and, and slightly campaigning. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I do. <laughs> what do you do, Beth? I don't know. I'm campaigning for the screen school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, I mean, I, I, think that, I think there's a... The key thing for me um, is we, we're talking about digital, re digital revolution and we're talking about um, how... how young people will be engaged and how they, uh, their, their potential is, is developed and realised. But what, what I'm hearing, and I, I don't think, I'm not criticising it, but what I'm hearing is, is, a, is, a, is quite an old-fashioned political way of saying, we will do this for the people and we will do this for the people. And it almost echoes to me back to uh, the sort of, kind of, sort of paternalistic socialism of the, of the 60s. And I think that the one thing that that needs to be considered, I mean, as well as looking for funding and everything, but the thing that needs to be considered is that young, the young people that, that, or a lot of the young people that we're, that we're talking about, actually are, are way more developed and advanced in the use of technology already than possibly some of the people who are looking to um, uh, make policy news night make policy um, okay so so I think that the, one of the things that people need to do to move this forward because I'm I don't have the experience to sort of you know make legislation or, or even talk about that is, is to actually kind of it's a more mature youth audience in this digital field and I think that that people who want to make policy who want to help them need to do a lot more listening to not just to what they want, you know, it's not like, you know, kind of like, uh, what, what do you want, kids? You know, it, it, it's more that they actually have working experience. They grow up using social networks. They grow up with uh, design in whichever field, technology. It, it's not new to them. And a lot of what I hear when we're talking about, well, we, well, let's, I mean, again, I'm not criticising, I'm just saying, I just think it's, 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 it's the language that's used, and I think that kind of this kind of old school thing. Well, we will do this, and we will do that. And, and to be honest, Andy, when you say, "I know you've got a campaign and all that sort of thing," but but rather than saying this is my pitch, if you like, that just get in and do it as much as you can. I think I think that's the difference with. First. I think that's. And, and I'm not saying. Got to be elected first. Yeah, <laughs> when, when, when you're elected. But I think, I, so, so to me, that's the thing, is that kind of if you're talking about how you move education forward, with all, there's lots of other factors, but I think it's also something that, that it's, it's younger people that use the digital technology and, and digital stuff now that can help move that forward rather than being a top-down thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. So, Claire, can we come to you, and, uh, and then we'll come to Mike, and we, we might not be able to have everybody speak on everything. We're going to run out of time, aren't we? But let, let's go for it. It's good. So I think the way that we're working and the way that we educate ourselves is changing a great deal. And the fact is that most young people now think about education and they think about the cost of it and, and taking time out. And so upfront fees or, or fees um, that you have to pay back, but also taking time out from work just isn't an option. I think lifelong learning, a culture and the opportunity to access courses over time whilst working is, is, is really critical. Um, I think that um, there's, there's a kind of interesting point around the, the robots are coming and automation and the kinds of jobs which are at threat and the, and, and the opportunities that arise for people who are educated in design, uh, who are kind of in roles that require empathy, roles which require an understanding of how to tackle a question really analytically, are not going to be automated. And so in a sense, I think design education has a really important role to collaborate with other types of courses and STEM, etc. And I think Manchester specifically has a really interesting opportunity around the Oxford Road Corridor, 
with all of these things that are going on around advanced materials um, and the incredible digital creative economy that, that exists here, to bring those two things together in spaces where graduates can see their ideas realised. Manchester has space, it has affordability of living, unlike other cities, predominantly London in this country. So I think we, there, there is a sense that you can see more um, entrepreneurs, more exciting businesses being embedded in the city. Brilliant. Thanks. Might, might get some thoughts from you, and then if anybody's got any comments, questions from the audience, maybe we'll try and squeeze those in before the next question. Yeah, I mean, just really uh, coming back to early points, I'm not sure how much devolution is really going to change things if there aren't the powers fundamentally from the centre shift back to Manchester in terms of schools, curriculum, all those sorts of things. So in many ways, it's already hidebound by what devolution actually means. Um, the flip side to that, I think, yes, once things are done top down, I also think it's incumbent on the institutions in developing partnerships, networking, a whole host of different uh, activities and devices to actually engage with business and actually to think about picking up on that lifelong learning message that actually we can continually reshape careers and continually shape the path to careers within businesses. Many of us will have many <coughs> jobs or many kind of opportunities in life. And I think that kind of active, continuous learning, networking, partnerships and collaboration is really key to this. Last thing I want to say is actually I also think within universities and courses, it's really critical that we start to understand and define what innovation really means. It's not a thing in its own right, it's actually a process. And there are so many courses that we go on or are partaking in life that actually, um, they actually don't engender necessarily a sense of curiosity something to spike the individual, something to actually cultivate the idea that I can do something and I can make a difference. So, you know, the biggest difference Manchester can make is offer up a stage, not just to people locally, but actually nationally to say there's actually something good going on here. Mm -hmm. And that will come out of the ability to network and open up opportunities for people across all levels of society. Okay, brilliant. I'm gonna, have we got any thoughts from the audience or should we move swiftly on? Yeah, can we get a microphone? Just I just wanted to um, mention the importance of um, arts education and creative education. I'm not sure anyone mentioned creativity just now, answering your questions. Um, but with regards to tech and innovation, creativity are pretty much um, vital to both of those. Um, and we're offering separating the creative industries from other industries, but that's not really the reality because every single industry needs some kind of creative creativity within it. Um, so shouldn't we really be starting to talk about STEAM rather than STEM, um, just because arts and creativity are so vital um, to all the other four? Um, and that could also be a way to promote gender equality as the majority of the arts sector workforce is currently women. Mm. Yeah, I think that probably plays to some of, some of what Ema was talking around about um, quality as well. So. Other questions, thoughts from the audience? We've got a hand at the back. Is it Tash? Yeah. Um, hello. Um, just building on that point, that we keep pulling sort of STEM and creativity apart, and we are talking about apprenticeships, we're talking about university, we're talking about lifelong learning. Um, but actually, the schools now, they're very pushing it towards STEM sort of. Uh, Education, which is fantastic, we need a lot of people in those areas, but they're cutting a lot of the creative sectors. So, I'm not going to make a question, but I'm just going to make a point. Um, yeah, it's instead of separating us out and make us into silos, how do you see that going back into the school so you can layer that creativity in? Because tech's amazing, but you need creatives mm -hmm. to sort of bring it to life. We've got somebody on the panel just wants to quickly well, comment on that one before, well, I, I, before we go on. I agree, I agree with that. There's a, an interesting uh, book by the technologist Paul Graham called Hackers and Painters, where he talks about the similarities between software developers and artists, largely because they, they are very interested in problem solving and making good things. So I, I absolutely agree about the need for the integration of, of arts and creativity. Yeah. I, I think there's an interesting point as well that... Um, in this country, you know, creatives have tended to be seen as like, you know, if, if you, the definition of a creative is someone who does some drawing <laughs> and then, you know, put them in a corner or something, you know, uh, or, or terms like Mac monkeys and things like that. But if you, if you look at the model in, in, in Japan, 
if there's a if there's a body or an organisation where they're putting together some people to solve a problem, not a design problem, a social problem, a political problem, a whatever. <laughs> one of the first people on that um, on that list, not me, but one of the first people on on that list is all, is nearly always a designer because the because in Japan they understand that designers, creatives, are primarily problem solvers. So you give them a problem and they'll and they'll solve it. It's not about it's not, creativity isn't seen as this kind of weird kind of waste of time that we, that this government seems to. Andy. Well, I, I think you've hit on a really important point because the drift in recent years has been towards schools as exam factories a little bit, hasn't it? And it's, we've seen creative subjects pushed out, but I think as you're saying, they're not just important in their own right. It's, they're important to every job now, aren't they? Because everyone has to be more resourceful in their work and more able to turn the hand and, and be able to, to think differently and creatively. I think it was Ken Robinson who was arguing this many years ago that you had to have creativity absolutely the front and centre of your curriculum and build from there. I was very quick to come back on Ian's point because I, I, hands up, you know, I'm an old school Westminster politician and I'm, you know, come, leaving that world behind so come back to design Manchester 2017 and my re-education might be well on, more on the way, more advanced than it is now. The only thing I would just say, Ian, when you describe young people today, I'd just say just be careful about the reality of young people's lives in Greater Manchester because I'm not sure they're all like you describe. And I would say that we've got to be honest about the reality of life in this city region. And particularly, don't just think of city centre Manchester, think of those towns across the north of Greater Manchester. And the reality is we've got a deep-seated cultural problem. Young people growing up in those towns expect to be employees, never employers. And that is still the reality. You know, they are some way from where we would want them to be. And some of the changes to schools and funding of education has taken them further away from their dreams, actually, in, in, in recent times. So there is going to be an element of we're going to have to do something here to lift people up, to give them hope for the future. But my plan is to try and just say, look, there is something there for you. We're going to give you that kind of chance to, you know, don't lose hope that there's, the really terrible thing I think at the moment is too many kids are losing hope that there's anything decent for them at the end of school. So they're switching off age 13, 14. And that for a city like this is devastating. It seems to me, Peter said it, in these times when it's going to be harder to compete internationally, Greater Manchester needs to invest in its people. We need to have the most highly trained, highly motivated, highly skilled workforce that is confident and optimistic about the future. That's what we've got to be if we want to attract inward investment. And, and that's why we've got to start, I think, the right question to start. Invest in those young people, invest in those skills and, and go from there. OK, we're going to move swiftly on to question uh, number two. So, um, Lou, Lou, could I just ask... Uh, it's, it's me over here. Could I just ask if anybody asks a question from the floor... Could you please stand up, otherwise our cameras can't pick you up. We're really keen to see who you are. Unless you're camera shy, in which case, stay sat down. Okay, uh, Paul Johnson, who's managing partner at Pannoni Corporate. Can we have your question, please? Thank you. London Mayor Sadiq Khan has asked for a London seat at the Brexit table and pushed for London visas to maintain London's economic growth and power. To what extent can city identity and devolution mitigate the impacts of Brexit, and how does this affect the creative industries? Okay, thanks, Paul. Any hands to go first on that one? Um, well, I've got news for Sadiq. Um, <laughs> you know, I know the way the European Union works, uh, and you know, Sadiq is not going to get a carve-out for London, I'm afraid. Uh, from Britain's decision to lead the European Union. Uh, so if there's going to be uh, any sort of more sophisticated uh, uh, system of work permits and visas or whatever, uh, it's got to work uh, for the whole of the country and for every sector and not just for the financial sector in London. I'm sure that's not what he meant, but that is an interpretation that could be placed. Uh, on his bid for special uh, uh, treatment. Look, the, the point is this, that um, there's almost no part of our economy or what we do in our country and our society and 
whether it be our university sector, almost anything else that isn't directly or indirectly um, exposed to our membership of the European Union. It may not be obvious at, at first sight, but the secondary and tertiary impacts and consequences for this are going to be huge for this reason, that there's very little that we do in our country, in our economy, uh, 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 that, that isn't done through networks, through ecosystems, through value chains, and those cross borders. And we have reshaped so much of what we do in this country around the opportunities uh, that Europe uh, has offered to us uh, during this progressive integration that we've undertaken during the last 40 uh, uh, years, that when you consider that what Brexit is about is essentially disrupting those links. It's about disrupting those networks and those uh, chains. It might be um, a, um, a, uh, a great distribution center for goods and widgets located in Greater Manchester or Northampton, but whose scope is distribution across uh, a network, a set of outlets across the entirety of Europe's single market. Now, is that distribution center uh, distributing those widgets right across uh, Europe's single market uh, going to remain in Greater Manchester or Northampton after we've left <laughs> the European Union and the single market? No, it's going to move to Darmstadt or Hamburg or somewhere else where it can continue its work freely, distributing uh, uh, all its goods and its widgets freely without tariffs, without customs duties uh, and all the rest. And this is what all this is about. But, 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 but here's the point. These businesses uh, are going to move in many respects, many, many cases, not all, obviously, because not all uh, are, are Europe-facing, but very many are, the businesses will undertake a costly adjustment of what they do. They will move from Britain, in many cases, to locations and centres uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the continent. You know, where businesses have their homes in, 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 in the UK, but their operations are across the single market, those too will move. It's not the businesses, therefore, I'm chiefly worried about as a result of Brexit. In most cases, they will adjust, move and survive. The people who can't adjust and move and survive so easily are the people who they leave behind, their employees. You know, they will not have the opportunity uh, to move and follow their work. Uh, because they won't have that free right to free movement in the rest of the European Union. Now, I'm not therefore saying that as a result of our leaving the European Union, there's going to be mass unemployment overnight. But progressively over many years, uh, as these adjustments and changes take place, there is going to be a colossal uh, churn uh, in business uh, and uh, employment. Uh, and the same goes, uh, I have to say, for, uh, for science, for research, for development, for academic work. All these activities do not take place in silos. They, take, they are undertaken in networks across borders, across Europe. And it's those networks and those ecosystems that, that are going to be disrupted uh, as well. And what we have to do, therefore, uh, in this country, uh, is obviously, given the circumstances, uh, make the best uh, of this situation that we can, and we have to do it uh, in two ways. Uh, we have to make sure that, given the loss of talent uh, that we are going to suffer in many cases by people uh, unable to move to Britain and work in Britain and supply skills and talents that we need uh, for our economy and, uh, and our cities to do business and to function properly, we are going to have to invest in a huge amount more training in our own people to make sure that we, are, that we don't literally starve of talent as a result uh, of the ending of, of, of free movement. And secondly, 
we have got to invest in specialization, in competitive advantage. Uh, we have got to do things in Britain differently, better. We've got to invest in innovation on a scale that we have never done previously. Because if we don't do that, we are simply going, not, not simply to lose our, um, our, our, our share of that European market and that share of talent which will not come to this country in the way that it has in the past, but we'll lose our competitive <coughs> advantage in so many different sectors as well. It's going to, we are facing a massive challenge. Uh, it, it's one that we have to embrace. We have no alternative given the vote that's taken place but it's going to require tremendous ingenuity across the country, and notably in, in, in regions like this. Okay. Ema, can, can city identity and, and devolution mitigate the impact of Brexit? Well, no, and I largely agree with, with Peter and his points. Um, I think, you know, when we, I would look at that from a technology perspective, uh, particularly I'm, I'm also part of a startup, uh, and we rely very heavily on Eastern European developers, colleagues, uh, who work based in Bulgaria, um, who many, some of whom were planning actually to move to London prior to Brexit and then following the whole situation just said this is not a place for us, but we work obviously remotely uh, as, as one team. And so, you know, while Peter is right to say we need to focus on innovation and growing our own innovation talents, I mean, cutting off that access to global talent is going to have a significant impact, particularly on startups. Um, so I'm quite concerned about that because there's an arms race for talent in technology and you know in, even in London it's highly competitive uh, developers can charge very high rate so I think this is going to have a significant impact on the SME startup community um, so I don't you know city can looking for a seat for London really you know I mean that's just politics right um, because that's ignoring the whole point of it's this entire country that are going to have to face the consequences of this and I, I was amused recently um, a friend of mine is a general manager in a small hotel in London and uh, her, her boss was pro-Brexit, pro-leaving. And he rang her up the morning after and he said, isn't it great, we're leaving. And she said, you know, every single member of staff is non-UK. She's going, who, who do you think is going to run the hotel? Nobody's going to run the hotel, right? So, you know, I, I find the whole thing has been so disingenuous uh, in terms of how, how, you know, how it evolved. I just think it is, as Peter says, a massive challenge. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, there's a part of me that's kind of hoping we might, you know, get to a point, because it's so hard to predict, that it may pull back. Uh, but then I think that's obviously just wishful thinking. Also, I'm pretty glad I'm Irish, so I'm still part of the European Union. So. <laughs> Hang on to that Irish passport. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Should, should we just pause for any comments or questions from the audience at this point? No show of hands? Yep. Can we get a mic? Um, I think it's just an observation, really. Oh. <coughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm usually quite camera shy, so... Uh, I think it's just really an observation that isn't a large part of the Brexit vote. In one way, not, nothing to do with the European Union. It is a, a protest against a political system yeah. of whatever colour that yeah. doesn't really seem to be speaking yeah. for um, everyday people. Yeah. Could I answer that? Andy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, 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 I feel this really passionately, because I hope Peter will back me up when I say this. I was kind of talking to a lot of these issues for many years about the deep alienation there was in former industrial uh, communities. And it goes back to the point I was saying at the beginning. The London perspective sh has shaped national policy for decades in this country. You know, the interests of those places didn't shape it. You know, these are the places that lost industry in the late 80s, early 90s. The good jobs went. Then the house prices collapsed at the same time and whole streets were bought up by absent private landlords. No government of any colour did anything enough actually to say, well, what is the future of these places? How do we get good jobs back in? And then they entered a whole new wave of profound social change when the European Union expanded. And again, they were left to cope with it on their own. So constituencies like mine got no extra help for the primary schools where there were more and more Polish kids turning up. They got no extra help for the GP surgeries. And it's, it's actually not, you know, I keep saying to people, People don't, can't, you can't read the Levo as xenophobia or worse racism, and maybe there were some small percentage of people who did it <laughs> nakedly for that reason. The deeper feeling is this, we, no one looks at us or thinks about us or cares for us 
And that really is, it was, a, it was a, as you said, a profound cry for change, in my view, in the way the country is run. You know, when these places needed help with manufacturing, the national policy was on services and, you know, technical education <laughs> universities, council housing, owner occupation, national policies never given them answers. And I think that's absolutely the way to look at it. And though devolution in England was not conceived to be the answer to the referendum result, we now must embrace it as such. And, and use it to give people uh, more solutions that speak more directly to them and much more focused on them and their, and their needs. Just, a, just a, while I've got the floor, just a comment on the creative industries in Brexit. I think you could be the biggest losers. I mean, I hate to you know, lower the kind of mood, um, but I think it was touching on what, what, what um, uh, Peter was saying. If you think about it, it's the emotion that's unlocked, it's the problem, isn't it? Or it could be, you know, the feeling that Britain has changed. You know, Britain isn't that place we used to love its music and its films and its design. You know, we, it's people, the risk for us is that people are undergoing a change in terms of how they look at us and view us and our, our cultural output. And I think, you know, that, I think we need to be really awake to that because it can be very, very damaging, I think, for the creative industries uh, if, if that mood about Britain has changed settles on the rest of Europe and the world. And it's, it's why the kind of views about Brexit and what it means needs to come through our creative industries and kind of inform the rest of Europe again that there isn't, we aren't all leavers now, you know, there is a kind of change, there is a, a constituency here that is very worried about these things and, uh, and wants to maintain those bridges that Theresa May and Boris Johnson are actively burning right now. Yeah. Ian, Brexit and the impact on the creative industries. Oh, I was hoping you weren't going to ask me. I, 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 I find it difficult to, to talk about it, you know, without industrial language or even creative industrial language. Um, I think, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's not... From a creative... Well, from my perspective, and there's lots of different kind of creative industries, obviously, uh, I'm really depressed now, thanks, Peter and Andy. <laughs> but, 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 there, but there was something that Peter, and Peter was saying that, that, you know, that there's a big change. And I think that kind of creatives, we're supposed to deal with change, we're supposed to celebrate change. And I don't want... So I'm not saying, yay, let's, let's get out of Europe and do some change. <laughs> but, but, you know, if it's true that, you know, there, I mean, there's always this talk about second referendums, blah, 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 and, you know. Um, but, it, but if it's true that we're out and we're out for good, then I think that creative industries have to see this as a, as a challenge and an opportunity. And if we say we're problem solvers, then let's solve that problem. Yeah. And I think, the, I think the one saving grace that creative <laughs> industries have, and I'm not talking, I mean, you know, I don't have a great record as an industry. I have a great record as a, as a, a creative, but not so good on the industry side. Um, but, but I think there's, I mean, I do a lot of work in Europe and, and, and further afield. And I think that you, you and, and I'm you know, not everybody. Um, but I think the one thing about creative industries is I think that kind of creative people have a, have a common language. You know, and I think so if, you, if you introduce industry into it and then you start talking about import taxes and, and all the kind of things that I don't really get involved in. But I think that the, the, the one thing that I did think was like, this, this could be a chance and, and maybe, we, maybe you know, we, we do reposition ourselves. You know, and I, I, don't, I don't mean going back to kind of, you know, the Beatles and swinging London and things like that because the world's changed and, you know, and in the same way that, you know, we, we, we did some work with Coca-Cola and they kind of wanted to reconnect with their pop cultural past when I mean, the reality is, is that kind of, you know, if Andy Warhol was painting, say, you know, sort of pop cultural icons now, it'd be an iPhone or, or some trainers. It wouldn't be a fizzy drink. Um, but I think that's the thing, is, it, is, is we don't have... We can't sit around moaning about it forever and we don't have another option, so we may as well look at it positively and what can we do? And, and you know, as, as people have alluded to, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's the creatives that need to lead the way because we don't really know what to do about money, so we <laughs> do some drawing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. So, so um, 
Claire and Mike, I'm going I'm to hold you <laughs> to start the next question, which is, is, is the perfect subject matter for you. So unless we've got any burning comments, questions from the audience, <laughs> let's move on to uh, the next question from Lindsay Whitley, who's over there, from uh, Transport for Greater Manchester. Um, hopefully this is an uplifting question. Um, public space, buildings, neighbourhoods and transportation of all types are key factors in how residents and visitors experience Manchester. Um, how can designers, architects, technologists and others um, improve the livability and usability of our city? Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so I have, I guess, directly to architects. I think that Manchester needs more fine-grained small spaces on the ground floor level. Um, every city kind of um, benefits hugely from public life when you have lots and lots of active shop fronts. Manchester, due to kind of the Victorian architecture and also some of the new stuff that's going up, <coughs> suffers a little bit from the size of the footprint of some of those places. So that's a direct um, one to them, I guess. I think for the planners in Manchester, um, there's so much car parking in this city. Um, and it's an amazing, it, it seems like for such a place that has so much going on, it seems like such a shame that whole swathes of the city are disconnected by some of this. The removal of cars from a city over time, whilst very political and can be very challenging, places like Copenhagen has demonstrated how that can bring people, bring activity, bring all sorts of interesting things back into the city. Um, and I guess for um, designers and technologists, I mean, I think city data and, and, and thinking about how we can create cities or, or efficiencies in cities around some of this stuff, there's an awful lot of buzz going on around that. But I think um, Manchester has done some great work on uh, combining its data and, and opening that up to companies and the uh, fantastic things that could be built off the back of that. So a kind of call to them to engage with it. Brilliant. Thanks, Ken. Mike, can we, can we get your expertise on this? Yeah, <clears throat> I think like Brexit, before you do anything to do with a city, you actually need a plan. Where's the plan? Is the first thing. Um, cities and the best cities in the world generally have a plan. And here in microcosm maybe a solution for a number of things. But, but broadly, um, the best cities in the world have a plan. It's focused on people. It's focused not just accessibility and social justice and the variety of things, getting people to work. But it's, it's actually uh, creating a rich tapestry, uh, building footprints that work, spaces that work for people, a combination of different transport modes that work in partnership, not one mode over the other. Um, but generally things where they're co-planned and co-designed work best. And when more and more people are involved in that planning process, you get more interesting, more competitive cities as well. I think Manchester's made great strides in terms of uh, densification in the city, numbers of people, uh, living in the centre, the vibrancy of the city, all those sorts of things. But what I would appeal for is probably greater quality in the everyday things, how we design the everyday services that people use, be it the idea of uh, understanding the transport network in its entirety to open up cho choices and opportunities. It's not just about attracting uh, a billion pounds in London for Crossrail or 350 million pounds has been announced in Manchester for a tram system, but how you network all those things together to make the sum of the parts greater than the whole. And you know, planning is important for that, but also a whole range of different design skills are necessary to bring to bear a better solution than just the sum uh, the separate parts. If you see what I mean, so. Quality is everything, but crucially to me, if we design around people and the idea of creating more walkable cities, they generally are more inclusive and a benefit to everybody. Uh, and I think that's really key. Manchester could take further strides, excuse the pun, but in, in developing its centre, but also areas like Bolton, Bury, and others, as better connected, more walkable, linked to public transport, that in turn become more inclusive for everybody that lives there. Um, so invest once, invest wisely, inv invest continuously, <laughs> is the message. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Ema, you, you and your colleagues are busy building bits of the city at the moment and communities in the city. What, what are your thoughts on livability and usability? Um, well, I, I'm very heartened to hear that uh, the, the idea of the user or the citizen at the centre of that whole debate, because we've had this smart city rhetoric now for nearly a decade. 
Um, and when you look under the bonnet, there's very little achieved actually globally, even in, in the rhetoric. And that rhetoric was really um, devised and put together by large systems integrators, you know, who wanted to have the infrastructural ownership of a city. So the Siemens or the IBMs or the Cisco's of this world. And it was a very technocratic <laughs> vision of what could be achieved. So one of my concerns is if we don't move away from that narrative to a user-centered narrative and a citizen-centered, we'll enter further into a surveillance state because, of course, everything is going to have sensors everywhere we move, all of our phones. You know, so, so initiatives that a city takes that it wants, to, it wants to gather more data for an efficiency perspective tends not to be a human perspective. So I think we need to have more uh, livability discussions that have citizens at their center and a lot more discussion about privacy and rights in terms of data. Uh, we know in terms of Internet of Things, this is going to become more extreme. And so we want to move our municipalities away from a very engineered uh, view of the city uh, and, and in terms of data. So, so while I think data is incredibly important, uh, I think we need to have a different discussion about uh, what, what has been taken from us and its uses and what is our contribution to the city. So, yeah. Brilliant. We're going to come on to data in a yeah. bit more detail shortly. Uh, any questions, show fans from the audience? Hello. Yeah, um, hi, I'm um, Dave Ellison. I'm, I'm Chair of Planning Manchester City Council. So I'm going to ask an odd question of the panel, really. Is planning what's really needed for cities? I think it, there's no doubt that it's required for transport systems, but some of the best areas of Manchester, the Northern Quarter, Chinatown, uh, Rusho, they weren't planned, they grew up because people came to Manchester, and Manchester's always been a very, very open city, so I'd like to agree with what's been said so far, and it's that openness and innovation that's so important for Manchester, um, and that, that's absolutely critical. So it all goes down to what creates a, a creative city and what's a successful city? What do the panel think about that? And can it be planned or is that not required? Peter, would you like I am sort of in favour of planning in cities, but I, I'm not very keen on sort of conventional zonal planning. And I'm certainly not, don't like scorched earth planning. I mean, what I would like to see is sort of what I think you were trying to describe, which is the way in which you've got sort of, sort of waves or sequences uh, of uh, people living and working, old and new, not in a sort of horrible, ugly, higgledy-piggledy sort of way, which you might infer from, from, from what I'm describing, but which is more organically uh, uh, driven uh, than zonally preordained. Um, and you just see old buildings turned into <coughs> new uses and functions. Uh, they have wonderful new uh, you know, design skills uh, brought to them. Uh, they provide uses which are social and cultural as well as economic. And there's a mix of all these things in, in different locations across your city. Uh, I mean, that and, and, and housing, obviously, uh, as well. Now, yes, you do need planning of uh, transport that's going to connect up these different um, uh, uh, locations. You need people to move around, uh, obviously. Um, but I think that uh, uh, we, we can bring, just as we bring <coughs> completely new sort of waves of creativity and design to everything else that we do, we have to bring it also uh, to the way in which uh, we allow cities organically to change and to grow. Okay. Any other thoughts from the panel? Just to chuck a thought or two in. Um, Claire, when Claire was talking, she uh, made me think of something um, which may be familiar to a lot of people here, but there's this point about um, how you green up a bit of maybe former industrial space or you just create these little kind of oases. I'm thinking of the, the High Line in New York for anyone who's been down, about down there. I mean, that seems to me to be a kind of model that Manchester should look at. Uh, because it really has opened up a whole new space, hasn't it, in the, in the city? And it's, it's, it's also been a driver for economic regeneration, as far as I can tell, you know, the building that's going alongside it now. And it's arguably, possibly a bit gentrified, which is another, another issue. But 
it's industrial heritage that has been opened up and has been hand, and is run by the community, as far as I can tell as well. It's not a, it's not a kind of state or a mayoral function. Uh, but it was the mayor, I think, of, it was Bloomberg, I think, who was kind of instrumental in handing over that uh, piece of infrastructure. I think there's much more of that we can do, just to kind of build those spaces into to, to Manchester. Manchester can be a, a touch kind of, you know, uh, hard to, to, to be a walker or a cyclist, and I think there's a lot more we need to do, do there. One last thought I would say is it very much struck me what you were saying. I think, it, it, and TFGM hopefully have some views on this, I think we've got a fragmented city region at the moment in that the city centre works better and better, but it's getting to it and from it, and it, that's the bit, and the, how do the smaller towns relate to the city centre, that's the bit that we're missing. And I think we need some design brains to go into Old and Rochdale and Bury and Wigan and say, actually, these towns haven't had a lot of thought given to their design and how they relate to the centre and how you connect, use up your old canal paths and all the rest of it. That's the bit we need to do to knit together this city region a little bit more because we love to celebrate it, but Greater Manchester's a little fragmented and unequal and it doesn't knit together quite as we might like to think it does. And I think that's where we've got to get some design brains in to say, well, how do you rethink these, live, these towns that are the dormitory towns for Greater Manchester and, and help people, you know, really improve the standard of people's living there so that they can access the city centre much more easily than they do. And, you know, that, I would say, is the next phase of Greater Manchester's work. Brilliant, Andy. Let's quickly take your question before we go to the next one. Uh, it's just a quick question for Mike. You said the best cities in the world are a plan based on people. Just out of interest, I was wondering if you could name a couple of the best cities and why they're the best. Not to put you on the spot. Uh, okay. Um, if you look at any of the indices that measure quality of life, uh, the factors that generally are recurring all the time are kind of open, accessible cities. that have been well planned, but to the point of not being planned to death. And I think that, to, to answer that question earlier on, it's about having a sensitive hand, a, a guiding hand on that, on that process. But they are generally cities that, uh, whether you call it from Melbourne to Vancouver to Zurich, they are in their own right city regions. Uh, they're very powerful in many respects. But they seem to balance both the density and land use mix with the opportunity for more playful uh, expressions in public space, but very well articulated transit systems that act as the glue and the binder to social and economic life in those cities. And as a right, most people would choose, ironically, to use public transport in those environments rather than drive a car, for instance. Yet I think we, uh, certainly in many cities, still consider a merit to success is uh, how much space we colonise on the road rather than uh, the quality of public right, life and our rights to that public life in spaces. Um, that, you know, for children, for anybody in, 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 in cities that should have equal access to those. So, um, yeah, good cities fundamentally are accessible, legible, welcoming places, and they need to be as open as possible. Okay, we're sneaking in one more question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, on this subject of space, um, I have a studio in Manchester. I moved up from London. I couldn't afford a studio there to pursue uh, and carry on creative work so I thought great I can move back to Manchester they've got these fantastic affordable spaces and guess what I've got an email that I got last week saying that I'm potentially going to get kicked out of that I'm sat talking to people tonight and they've received the same emails from different studios so as cities do start to develop my concern is that what does happen is the affordable creative spaces mm. that lead to all this innovation and development that you yeah. talk about is disappearing. Mm. And already you will have people who will have that ambition going, actually, do I want to stay in Manchester? Because even though Manchester is much more affordable than London, <coughs> it's catching up to London prices. <laughs> it's getting more expensive. And it's funny when you're talking about car park spaces. Um, I travel into the city centre because it's expensive to live in the city centre now. There aren't actually that many car parking spaces and the actual connections within the city are very good. But as Andy quite rightly said, if you want to commute from Bury or for other places, it's really difficult. And actually that is a really key thing that I'd be sort of interested to know 
are you going to look at keeping a sustainable network of places in Manchester for creatives? Because it's it's not affordable. It's getting a bit, you know, it's a sad, it's a sad <coughs> state. Anyone like to respond to that? I mean, You've got a round of applause. That's good. That's good. That's good. You're not on your own. That's for moving up from London. That's the round of <laughs> and I, I think the, the, the slightly sad thing about that, actually, is this, we know this, right? This whole pattern of regeneration where you have creative industries moving in, taking low-rent spaces. You know, we've had it in shortage. We've had it close. We know all this. So the question, I think, that is probably one in terms of what is the city council in its leadership going to do? to encourage property developers in the area not to be avaricious about that gain and drive out the very people who created it. Now, if you look at an area like Temple Bar in Dublin, which was you know, the first area in Dublin that had a huge amount of uh, European money put in to create a cultural quarter because a natural organic community had emerged there. Exactly the same thing happened. Um, and then it became an area which had lots of people coming for stag parties, right, because too many pubs in the area. And it only took them 10 years to figure out they needed the traders in the area to really club together and start to support the creative side. So I do think there should be tariffs in place, uh, placed as a condition of planning, that everybody benefits from that. Because otherwise, I mean, it's so, it's so obvious, we know it, it's not like we don't know what happens. Okay, unless anybody has any burning comments, we're gonna try and whip through the next two questions, because we've got a question coming up on Mayor, and it would be remiss of us we'll be here, Andy, not to get to that. So can, can we go to Sarah Tompkins? Just over there, can we get a mic to Sarah? Um, uh, and uh, Sarah is Destination Director at Marketing Manchester. Hello, good evening. Um, it's touched on a bit of what you've already talked about, Ema. So uh, Manchester is currently running a project called City Verve. It's demonstrating how city management, sustainability and services will be revolutionised by the Internet of Things. So I'm interested to know how the panel feels about real time and open data and how they're going to change our cities and what the role of design is in making sure that we use best of the new technologies. Okay, we have to begin with you on this. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, think, I think certainly my experience in terms of, I, I worked for the Mayor of London as his Director of Digital Projects. They established the London Data Store, which was an initiative to put all of London's uh, public um, uh, uh, data, public service data in, into the public domain. Obviously that included transport and we, we always knew that transport was going to be a game changer, particularly for example, real time bus data for people in London. Um, and the interesting thing we did in London was not to do that in isolation as City Hall, but to collaborate with a broad range of technologists. I mean, we literally said, we want to open up London's, London's data, will you come and help us? And 60 amazing technologists came to City Hall and we said to them, what do you want us to go after first? And they said, crime and transport. And they said something very important to us at the time. They said, uh, go ugly early. In other words, you know, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good because bureaucrats, I can assure you, keep going, no, we don't want to release that yet. It's not ready because it's never ready. Okay? Um, and so we began a very collaborative uh, uh, engagement to release the city's data. And, and I think you know, people can't conceive of the, the cycle hire scheme without the app or you know, their, bus, their bus apps. And I think that kind of um, collaboration, open collaboration between a municipality or regional authority and its technologists you know, creates a situation where you are reducing friction in the city. And that has to be a key ambition. We want to have a frictionless journey around our cities. And, and that's, it allows you to make the decision, do I take? So when I come out of my home in London, I've got two options. I can take one bus to you know, the Northern Line and one to the Piccadilly Line. And it's those small, trivial decisions that seem trivial that make a huge difference to a city. Um, so I think the more open innovation that we have, and especially as we're looking forward to, to IoT, you know, there's a, there's a lot of challenges, and, and I don't think most, and I'm not, being, I'm not saying this about Manchester City Council, it's true, of, and I say this as a former local government official, we do not have the technological capabilities inside local governments to deal with these issues. And that's why we need to have much more open collaborative, collaborative discussions with designers, with creators, with technologists. I always said if I had my choice, I would stuff local authority planning teams full of designers and technologists, and we need to bring that creativity right into the heart of the municipal authority. Ian, the role of design in making best use of technology, we were talking a little bit about this before we, before we came off. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I mean, if you, in terms of design as being, uh, again, like problem solving, as opposed to the, you know, the aesthetics or the, you know, the surface. I mean, I, <clears throat> I really agree with, with 
with what Emu is saying. Because I think there's, there's, a, there's a real danger that you know, we're talking about, you know, I know smart cities is, a, is, a, you know, is, is 10 years old and things, but there's, you know, we were, we've been talking to various people about the, the Oxford Road Corridor and so the city verve and, and all those things. And, but, and not just this, not in, just in Manchester, but in a lot of other places. I think there's a real danger that, that un, until the, the reasons why this technology is, is being developed for the people who are going to use it, it's just going to be like they're going to, it's going to be like a physical, re it, well, there's a danger that it's a physical representation of what the internet used to be, just all that kind of whiz, bang, all these kind of fantastic things going off, we walk down the streets, you know, and, and the, the point is, is some of the most visible, um, and I'm not talking about visible in terms of the, the great apps, you know, that give you fun, but the most visible things are, you know, things where you can go and take a selfie you know, in some booth and send it off to somebody. And, and all these kind of like little kind of like, you know, sort of traveling circus kind of gimmicks. And I think that the danger is, because there's a lot of big companies that want to get their kind of technology out there and they kind of want to use this. And I think that, I think that obviously it needs to look good and, um, you know, get my phone number later. Uh, if we're doing some campaigning, <laughs> if we're, you know, doing, we're doing some business. Um, now who's campaigning? Yeah, yeah, well, you know. So. Um, but, you know, but I think that, but the point is, is that it, it's... There's, there's a point about cities as well, and this is going back to some of the other, the other questions, that, that just if we're talking about design and whatever, brand communication, the, the best brand communication is where you, is where you allow ownership of that brand communication to your target audience, etc., and I think that's about the cities. Is that you know people, people feel have a, have a need to have a sense of ownership of this of their own space of, of the of, of where they are in a, in a city, you know. And the idea that the idea that um, you know that I mean there is no one Manchester. There's as many Manchesters as there are people, you know, in, in the city or visiting the city or even with the knowledge of the city, you know. And so, but, and, and what is the ownership that they want? And, and the technology that we're, that we're talking about, you know, the sort of the smart city and that stuff, that should all feed into that and to give but, a greater sense of ownership. But it could link to your first point that you made, Ian, about this has got to mean politics done differently and not the old top-down way. Because if, let's for, say, for instance, there was the data on air quality in Greater Manchester available every day in real time. I think people would be quite shocked actually by it because uh, it's very, very poor on Oxford Road actually uh, and in other parts of Greater Manchester. And the point being that you would empower people and say, well, why is it? And you'd empower those communities to say, hang on a minute, I'm walking my kids down there every day. You know? Or if it's like, I think, uh, Ema, when the data came out on cycling accidents in London. I remember that provoked a major debate, didn't it? All of a sudden, these little kind of pinch points were just very evident. And it, again, it empowered people a little bit. And I think we need, is, we need a bit of that, don't we? The point is, is what you do with the data. The cities around the world have data stores. Um, those that can mine that data can create stories from them. But I think, you know, data is very powerful, but ultimately, I think if we're moving generally from this idea of the internet of things, which is all sorts of stuff, we actually need to think more about the internet of place and rooting it back here to build powerful stories and narratives. And like you say, there probably are many Man Manchesters, but the city and the city region and your role, and I think you're probably doing a fantastic job in, I think it's something like 90,000 jobs are dependent on tourism and marketing. It's worth billions to the economy and the rest. It, it, it's vitally important that there is an image of Manchester that is projected in the digital medium. And I think... So much what we see worldwide is actually cities don't actually have a control of how their data is used. And actually, if one thing Manchester can do, it can take back some of that story in all sorts of particular ways. And I think there's a challenge there. Because if Manchester does take back its message and control more in terms of communications and marketing messages, it will lead to, obviously, greater benefits in terms of the economy and locally as well. I mean, we're seeing masses and masses of data being generated in, in the way that you've described. And increasingly, that will happen as computer chips get inserted into endless physical objects and the Internet of Things grows and grows. The question is, what are the opportunities for us created 
uh, by the generation of, of that data. Now, obviously, a lot of that data is used to inform or drive consumer and retail uh, choices, but that data can also enable us to analyze and drive the redesign of urban systems, health or traffic or energy, uh, but it can also enable us uh, to uh, uh, think through, uh, based on the masses of data, to think through new policy solutions. And those policy solutions uh, and policy ideas um, you know, have got to come as much from startups using uh, big data uh, as those ideas come from think tanks uh, in the future. And that's why, just going back to the original point that Ian made when he was, you know, unintentionally and unwittingly slightly disparaging about <laughs> politics and politicians. <laughs> I, I know you well, did that. that very justified. Oh, you know, I know you didn't mean it, Ian. I, I, I know that's not what you were really <laughs> saying. But you, what you were, you, were, you were trying to sort of create an, uh, um, a, an old-fashioned and called conventional image of politics, which is this top-down process that imposes policy solutions on people. Now, surely the creation of big data enables that to sort of go in the other direction. Uh, it goes bottom-up rather than top-down. It's informed by uh, people's preferences and choices and what they want from their lives and how they want change to take place. Uh, and that is what politics has got to uh, harness. How? I'm not absolutely sure, but I, I know that it can happen and I know that it must, not least for all the reasons that Andy was talking about, the change we need in politics if people are going to take ownership again back uh, of, the, of the way in which decisions are taken and the way in which policies are formed so that they just feel that everything really genuinely is being done in their name and not just for them. Okay, brilliant. So, so through poor chairmanship, we're in the, in, in, we've got the last few minutes of, uh, of the event left, so we're going to move really swiftly. One last question, Casper, with a 30-second response from everybody on the panel. So, Ed Matthews, can we, can we quickly get... Ed's question, Ed is General Sector Lead for Creative and Digital Industries at Lancashire County Council. Then we're Good going to whip evening. through the panel for a quick sound bite from everybody. Good evening. Um, question about devolution of Metro Mayors. Um, Manchester has a devolution agreement that covers a wide range of public services including transport, skills, police, planning and health. Next May, it elects its, uh, an executive mayor who will win a region comprising of a 10 Agma district local authorities. What will be the practical impact in Manchester and other cities of devolution and metro mayors? And how will it affect places like Blackpool, Preston, which are not in those areas? Okay, Claire, we're going to run left to right and get really quick comments from everybody, or Casper's going to drag me off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to build on Andy's point before about, um, um, I guess, how post-Brexit um, and also, I guess, with Devo, that how, how cities talk about themselves. I think cities are built on mythology and actually um, going to the world and talking about Manchester, which already has its own story on the world stage and an incredible one, um, and, and marketing it again um, as an open and creative place. I think that's a role that the new mayor should play. Brilliant, thank you. And concise, thank you, Peter. The reason why I'm such a strong supporter of Devo and the whole Devo agenda is that whereas with the last Labour government we were very good in our attempts to rebalance the economy, to transfer resources and to regenerate uh, cities and bring the North to, uh, uh, alive again, we did it, I'm afraid, without devolution of power and responsibility and decision making. We were very preoccupied by the money and the resources, but not the, uh, not, not the power. And that is the difference uh, between what we are doing now uh, and what we did then. And I support uh, 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 the new devolution component of our desire to rebalance the economy. And why the Northern uh, Powerhouse? Because it, it's a wonderful way of badging the North's interests and its image uh, and its identity rather than simply setting cities in the North against each other in a competition for resources. And it creates a banner 
behind which um, uh, people and arguments in the North can be rallied and put across to the country as a whole. And that's why uh, I think North, the Northern Powerhouse concept is something to be built on and developed and not thrown away. Emma. Um, well, one of the things I've uh, noticed uh, over my career as a public official and working in technology <coughs> is the deep lack of technology knowledge uh, at political leadership level, a deep lack of knowledge. And so, as I mentioned earlier, when I hear politicians talking about returning to an industrial strategy, I'm going, where are you living? So, you know, this is an opportunity. I would say about Mayor Boris Johnson, I'll make no other comments about him, um, except to say he really doesn't get technology. I mean, he did stand up publicly and call it bookface, <laughs> without irony. But he provided terrific leadership in terms of making London a city that gave a clear signal. We were opening our data, we were open for business, we understood tech. And so I would say to Andy, you have a lot of people in this room, including myself, uh, should you be mayor, who would be happy to give you some strong technology advice, but I would urge you to put that at the core of what you were doing, because it is the future of work. And so you and the officials that support you need to really understand that agenda fully. Thanks, Emma. We, we've lost um, Peter has to catch a train, so thank, thank you, Peter. <laughs> it's not a protest. Ian. Uh, well, well, now he's going, I can, I can agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think that devolution is only worthwhile if, if, you, if you can make it work. Otherwise, it just creates, you know, more mess. But I think, and, and there's also a question that, that, how does it work? Well, it has to be doing something than having something centralised. So there's no point in just transferring the power and decision making from one place to another place that happens to be closer yeah. to home. But I think there's also, a, there's also a, I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there's a point where, you know, that needs to be embraced by everybody. It can't just be like a, people sitting back and observing that power has been sort of, you know, devolved from one place to another. It needs to be, the opportunity and the potential of it needs to be grasped with both hands and I think that you know rather than waiting around I think especially in the creative industries you know I mean like, um, we were talking earlier or someone was talking earlier about uh, you know the, the affordability of places but I think that the whole point about devolution is that that, that, that is seen as an opportunity for everybody just particularly in the creative industries because that's why we're here to kind of take initiative it's not about taking power it's taking initiative and, and if you've got strong initiative and strong vision, then if the power's not quite right, you just sidestep it and you go around the edge, you know, and find a different way around. You know, power's only like a, not an obstacle to moving forward. You know, it's some like vision me standing on a soapbox. <laughs> but, but I'm talking about in creative industries, you know, it's just, we need to do something as well, not just wait for someone else to do it. Andy. Well, I, I thought really long and hard before I decided to put myself forward um, to be Labour's candidate. And I really thought about politics and the state it was in. And I also thought, if I'm honest with you, about my own experience, my own journey as an MP and how I've been frustrated arguing for a former industrial town in Parliament and feeling sometimes it wasn't listening and, you know... So I've been on that, and then obviously I worked with the Hillsborough families, and I, I just saw for myself then, if, if, if large chunks of government and Whitehall could ignore the North, it will do. It just will. It just doesn't want to listen, actually. They, they don't want to do anything necessarily for us. And I just kind of have come to, after, after 15 years in Parliament, I've come to the conclusion that it isn't going to fix the problems at all, or, the, or not just the problems, but the, the things we want to do in this room, the things we would want... Manchester and Greater Manchester to be, uh, because I think it is fundamentally dysfunctional. Um, so I took the view that I, I think I can uh, achieve more by leaving, but I, I, I don't want to put the emphasis on the I actually, because to answer the question, it's going to be what we make it, isn't it? It's going to, this moment that's coming, because let's be honest, to be fair to George Osborne, he announced it in this room, what he has put in place is a fundamental change that could I stress could rebalance the country because it could lead to things being done differently here 
And when we do things differently here and it looks better than what they're doing down south, they might go, hang on a minute, why aren't we doing what Manchester's doing? You know, and it could change things quite profoundly. <laughs> but I would just say to all of you, it's going to be what we make it. And, you know, I know everyone's probably feeling cynical about politics at the moment and despondent about it, probably. But this is a bit of a life raft, actually, isn't it? And it's a kind of thank chance, well, let's do it differently. I take on board all of Ian's points. I'm not actually doing this to do politics as we've always done it. I'm not. And I'm, I'm not an expert, probably, in building that capacity amongst you know, the community, the voluntary sector. I want to do that, though. I want it to come bottom up. And I actually don't... You know, if someone came to me and s said, do you know what, there's no creative space left in Manchester, I wouldn't necessarily say, well, I've got a big lever. And I, and what I would say, well, let's see what, let me see if I can open the door that helps you solve that, that problem. You know, I saw Manchester go through that, actually, with the music scene. I think it got complacent about its grassroots music scene and has actually suffered for that. And we mustn't go through that same thing again. You need to preserve a kind of ecosystem, don't you, within the, within the city. So that, anyway, that, that's what brings me to, 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 to why I want to do it. I kind of feel more change is possible via this route. But it's not possible for politicians coming up with great strategy documents. It's going to be possible because of the optimism it unlocks and hopefully the way the new mayor goes about his or her work in terms of involving people and giving the real sense that policy can be changed. Uh, so that's the spirit in which I'm uh, approaching it. And in terms of how can it work for Preston and, and other places, it is Peter's point. You know, I will work with the mayor of Merseyside or of West Yorkshire or South Yorkshire where it's in our interest to do so and there's already talk of a body, an emerging body called the Council of the North I don't, I don't watch Game of Thrones but everybody tells me it sounds very, very Game of Thrones and it's not a, a power a land grab on my part but I think it is interesting isn't it if you think about this if such a body started to come into existence it would rebalance politics wouldn't it if that body started to say at a budget or a Queen's speech, do you know what, the North wants this, this and this it's a brave government that says, well, thanks for your input, but we're just going to ignore you again. It won't be able to do it. And I think the North needs to find its political power now in these post-Brexit kind of times. It does. And it's going to be not what politicians, what power politicians give it, but what power people give it in terms of the demand, you know, and, and the demand to do things differently. So, I don't know, amidst the gloom, it's you know, I'm excited by it. And I'm excited by my campaign. You know, I'm hopefully going to you know, get over some of this as part of the campaign, which launches next month, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ian? To the, to the yeah, yeah. Not quite tonight, but I suppose the final point is it's an open invitation. I have not got all the answers by any means, shape or form, but I do invite, you know, people to get in touch and build on some of what we've discussed tonight, because we're going to have, all of us, whichever political viewpoint we come from, if we're not going to make this a moment of change, well, when are we going to have a moment of change in Greater Manchester? So let's, let's get on to this and, and make sure we make the most of it. Mike, final 20 seconds before I we... I wish you well. Yeah, we just very, very quickly. I think uh, opportunism, the power, the swagger, bring it on Manchester. You can do it. If any city can, it will be here. I would like to say one other thing, though. It... it needs fundamental change, the country in a way, because devolution's fine, but it's still, we're still riddled by and, and held back in many ways by the Westminster model, uh, by the London model. It's a London-centric world in that sense. We need fiscal devolution yeah. to go hand in hand with power and hand in hand with the opportunity we all want to create. If we don't have greater devolution in terms of uh, finance and where our taxes go, the ability to, to redistribute, to uh, levy taxes where we think they're appropriate as well. If we don't have those powers, I think devolution will be not a failure. It's a step along the road, but it won't go as far as it could do. And so I think it's incumbent on whoever is mayor to carry on challenging the status quo therein. Okay, so we're inefficiently over our, over our deadline and we're going to continue um, any questions from the audience in, in the bar, which is possibly the best place. So all, all that remains is to say, um, I think, thank you to everybody who's come and supported tonight. Um, a, a big thank you again to our sponsors, Pannoni Corporate, who've made um, tonight possible and free to anybody who wanted to attend. And of course, an enormous thank you to um, our panel. So um, please join me in thanking everybody who's helped tonight. <laughs> <laughs>